Thank you. Uh, so, as been discussed before, during treatments, cavitation can occur either within a water coupling balloon between the transducer and the head, or inside the uh, the brain. Uh, and I'm going to discuss how to discriminate between those two kinds of uh, cavitation events with by using just one single PCD. That is, will be the first part of my talk. And second part will be how to use also one single transducer uh, to achieve transcranial focusing with almost no compromise in terms of focusing quality. So in the first part, as um, Costas presented before, uh, by using a set of PCDs and looking for uh, the, the time of flight, one can localize cavitation and image uh, cavitation passively. This is an example of uh, passive imaging cavitation that we performed a while ago in the lab. This is a, an image of one single cavitation bubble in a sheep brain. This was by using ultra-fast imaging. In that case, we are using a large set of, uh, of elements, 128 in, in this case. And we would like to be able to uh, not localize, but at least just um, differentiate cavitation coming from the outside or the inside of the brain with one single PCD. In that case, we have information uh, from one location only. So time of flight is definitely not an option in that case. So what we do is that we record in time the response of the, the bubble. And as Costas mentioned, you, you would see um, harmonics. And actually, bubbles coming from the outside or the inside of the brain have a different distribution in terms of, um, of harmonic distribution because of the, the filtering effect of the skull. The skull is going to absorb more the highest frequencies. And if we compare those two, actually, the uh, harmonics uh, drop more quickly uh, when cavitation is going through the skull. So basically, by comparing, for example, the half harmonic uh, to uh, the ultra harmonic, and we took the fifth ultra harmonic, uh, the ratio between those two is thus much higher outside the skull than inside the skull. And by setting up a threshold, one could discriminate between those two. This is what we did actually on, on monkey skulls and, and human skulls. Uh, monkey is uh, in a blue. Uh, human skull is in uh, uh, green and without, I mean, without skull, actually, it's in red. So you can see that even though we have some variability, because I mean, gravitation is a stochastic phenomenon, um, we were able to set up a threshold that would provide us with a 100% sensitivity and um, specificity through the skull of uh, monkeys and, and, and humans. And you will find more details in this um, article, PMB, that we published this, this year. Second part of my talk consists in, in, again, using one single element, a focus transducer this time, and we would be able to achieve the same focusing quality as can be achieved by using multi-element transducer, for example, 1,000 elements for the Insight Tech um, system, where you actually adjust the phase on the element to recreate a good focus through the skull and we would like to be able to do the same with just one single channel and one transducer, being able to create this uh, phase matching, actually, to be able to focus through the skull. Um, like that, it seems impossible. But actually, if you insert an acoustic lens in front of this transducer in order to reshape the beam and achieve exactly the same shape as the one you would have with a multi-element channel, then that would be possible to, uh, to do. So that's what we patented a, a while ago, and, and we um, actually tested it. So the first phase is the same, using this lens approach mm -hmm. or the um, multi-element approach. Uh, we first need to simulate the propagation of the, the wave through the skull in order to determine the phase shift. And then we use those information not to adjust the shift on each single element, each element of the array, but to adjust the thickness of the, um, the lens in order to, uh, to compensate for those shifts. And if we do so, you see here uh, the effect. So this is by using all transducer, single element transducer on the left without any corrections, by just using the single element with no lens. And uh, on, on the right is the, uh, the corrected 
um, focusing that we obtained through the skull with the lens attached to the, the beam. And we tested it on, on three skulls. On average, at the target location was 10 times more energy. This is valid for one single location, but we also tested that by rotating the, um, the single element and the, um, the lens attached to it, we can also steer the beam. You can see in the lowest part that we can still achieve aberration correction by, with the same lens by tilting those two together, the lens and the, the transducer. And we can actually tilt the beam almost up to uh, nine millimeters uh, and almost 10, 10 millimeters in each direction and keep a good aberration correction with, with this approach. So uh, here is what we can do with one single element, either to binary uh, localized cavitation or to achieve uh, transcranial focusing. I would like to thank my colleagues and especially Guillaume Mabour, PhD student who, who did uh, those two um, uh, applications. Thank you for your attention. Go ahead. Very interesting work. Um, I was just wondering, how would you design the lens? So I assume that you get the CT scan data and then you basically construct the geometry, but the phase aberrations come from the skull. So how would you come up with the numbers with, for the skull parameters for each specific case to design a lens? And following that question, what is that lens made of if it's not a secret? Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> so first, I mean, to, uh, the, the skull properties, this is based on, on the work we've done for the past 20 years on, on focusing the beam through the skull, uh, very similar to what InsightTech is doing, where you, you, you model basically the properties of the skull based on CT data. Um, and the thing is, we use the same simulation in this case, it's just that the information we get out of the, the simulation in terms of phase shifts induced by the skull are used to compute the thickness of the lens. And so the lens that we're using is a silicone lens. The speed of sound, the only thing is that the speed of sound of the material needs to be different from water. And in our case, the speed of sound is actually lower than water. It just makes the, the lens easier to construct because then you, you might have a, uh, uh, the thickness is, is just larger. And basically what we do is that we, well, you will find a lot of details in the PMB um, paper, but we, uh, we cast the lens and it's based on, we mix two, two uh, products to, to get this silicone based. It's for, for, for uh, dental applications actually. So the good thing is also that this lens is actually biocompatible. Hey, Quickly. Nice talk. Obviously my talk, my question is on the bubble side. So in your spectra that you saw, there was like a baseline shift. Do you really need to have broadband emissions in order for the, for the, for the algorithm to work? In no, this? no, because no, we there don't. was a clear baseline shift in, your, in the spectra that you saw in your, your second Yes, slide. because actually we, we did so, this from? was with and without the, the bone in place. So, okay. so it affects, the, the bone is filtering all the signals, the, the okay. harmonics, but also the, the broadband noise is also sh is also filtered okay. by the, the skull. So, so yes, you have on average you have at least a 12 dB attenuation when you place the skull, and it's, it will just those 12 dB is for one megahertz, and it will be higher for higher frequency, but it affects the entire, the entire spectrum. Yes. Okay. Yes. And one conceptual question. How, do you think that this will work when we try to implement control methods where we start from zero pressure and we increase the pressure at small steps so you will not have the full-blown spectrum to differentiate where things happen? You might start having first the second harmonic, then the third harmonic, and then all the components will, will come into the spectrum. That might be more challenging, yes. Um, I would just assume that, that depending if cavitation is occurring inside or outside, when you increase the... Um, you would still see that, that the ratio, the harmonic ratio, will vary differently for, for bubbles located inside or outside the brain. So it's, but you have to compare two, two harmonics. Okay, thanks. Okay, last question. So, um, very, very interesting talk. Uh, do you have a sense of why you were able to scan such a large angle? I mean, this is like the optical memory effect but there, usually, the angle is very small yes. that, you, that you can scan. It's a very and also, uh, related, relating this to uh, your earlier work in, in rats, where you showed that there's all these uh, aberrations and reflections inside the skull, 
Would this be a really good solution uh, for that, do you think? Um, so first comment, um, I did not have time to explain why we believe this was supposed to work. I think it, well, actually it's, um, it's based on what is currently done in astronomy when you compensate for the atmospheric uh, uh, disturbance. And, and it's called the isoplanetic angle. So it depends mostly on the, um, the skull uh, correlation length. And the fact that when you tilt the beam, the, the wave is always going through almost the same part of the skull. So in theory, if the skull was infinitely thin and uh, immediately very close to the transducer, you could just tear the beam away as away as you want. The fact that it's thick, so you have a slight difference in terms of, uh, of um, uh, incidence angle. So the effects are slightly different, but they don't differ that much. You always cross the same area of the, of the skull. So you have, uh, I mean, after 10 millimeter, you see that it is degrading, in, but, but it's degrading slowly, I'd say. And for the, to, to compensate from uh, animal reverberations, um, those were mostly due to the fact that the, yes, we, we were using low frequency in a small brain. So that was difficult to, to compensate for. It, it might be useful for animal experiments to increase the frequency and yet achieve some aberration correction because at some point if you go up to five megahertz then you might begin to have some aberration induced by the, um, the rodent skull. Okay, thank you very much. We better move on. Thank you. Thank you.